yesterday. Good job. Uh, I don't have any stats yet because I need to wait until uh, everyone submitted because they can submit today for 80%, tomorrow for 60%, the day after the reporting. So uh, we'll hold off any burning questions on any assignments until then. And then I can tell you as much as I can tell you. Uh, assignment two will be on Wednesday. So we're going to keep it coming. You guys are here to, to work in the program, and this is what you're doing. Yeah. Do you think it'll be t like an equivalent amount of time for this one, or longer, shorter? What, what's hopefully, you've gotten better, right? So hopefully, it'll take less time, but then maybe it's more work. So. <laughs>
right? It's not just the binary code itself, and why not? Yeah? It needs to specify which system and which architecture can run on it. Yeah, so maybe, so you have 32 bit and 64, right? So you may need some metadata to try to tell the operating system what kind of file is this, what kind of code is this. So if you statically link the GCC, uh, the libc library, 
you will generate about a 20 to 30 meg file, even for a simple hello world, because the entire code of libc is included in your binary. So why is that good? Why do that? Yes, it'll still run on a computer that doesn't have this library. Libc, everything has libc, but maybe it's a special library. What else, why is it good? What was that? It could be secure. In what way? You will have all the good. Uh... So maybe we're using a special version that maybe we've added some uh, some security features. Yeah. Slightly faster. It could be faster if we do some kind of whole scale optimization. We could be able to maybe optimize that down. What else? So main, one of the main reasons is portability. That's one of the huge reasons, so that I can ship this binary to any system, and now it doesn't matter what libraries they've installed, or even worse, what versions of which libraries they've installed, right? <coughs> Rather than using whatever crap library they have, if I include the latest, greatest version, now I'm good. What's the downside there? Large file size. Huge file size. What else? Well, huge. I mean, come on, we're talking a couple of things. Yeah. Yeah, so this is the flip side of the security coin is what if there's a security vulnerability in that library that I've just included in this executable and given you, right? If it's a shared library, you can just update the library on that system and now every program that uses that library will get updated. But in this case, I have to recompile your application using the new updated library to get those security benefits. Any other pros there? So the other type is dynamic linking, which essentially when the process starts, every time you first try to call the libc function, it, the system, the dynamic linker will then look for where is libc on this system, will load it into your process space and then do all the linking for you. So we'll see exactly how that works, that's what I'm talking about at a high level. Um, but these are the two main differences between these two cases here. So, the most common executable file formats are ELF and PE for Windows. So the important thing about executable file formats, right? Remember, we have to think we are looking at a program that just exists. It's a file, right? It just exists as bytes on disk, right? Yet somehow the operating system needs to properly load that code into the proper locations set up memory in the proper way, and execute that program so a new process can be started. So these file formats, ELF and PE, must contain all the information in order to do that. And so the ELF file format is the main, it's the most commonly used binary object format. It's architecture independent, which is nice, right? You can use it on MIPS, x86, x64. There's four file types, either it is relocatable, which means that the linker has to be involved before it can actually be used. It can be executable, which means we are ready to go. We can execute this binary right off the bat. Shared, which means it's an ELF shared library. So it's not executable at all. It is a library that can be used by other files. Uh, and finally, we have core dumps. So these are, anybody, Remember the program crash on them and then have like a something, a core dot some number? Yeah, so that is actually a specific ELF file format. What's really cool is you can use GED to debug your program right at the memory, like what the memory was right at that state. So you can see, so that core dump has the entire layout of memory of your program at that specific point that your program crashed. <coughs> Very handy tools. So actually the the most used tool that I use when doing any kind of security stuff, especially for like capture the flag hacking competition, is the file command. What does a file command do? Yeah. It shows you the type of the file. Yeah, it shows you the type of the file. How does it work? What was that? Sugar file handler. Say it again? Sugar file handler. Yes. All it does is a very stupid program. <laughs> All it does is look at the first couple bytes of the file. And it has this huge database of, if it starts with these three characters, that means it's a JPEG file. If it starts with these other characters, that means it's an EMP file. If it starts with these characters, that means it's an ELF file. 
So file command is really good to run on any kind of thing that you don't understand what it is. And it won't tell you exactly what it is, right? It'll tell you what it thinks that file is based on the magic numbers or the file format. So super handy. I run this on anything uh, unknown that, that I don't know what it is. Um, or maybe, no, I'll stop on that. Uh, the other program that's really good is the read elf program. So I would look at this, look at the documentation, this allows you to query a lot of information about an ELF executable file, or it doesn't have to be executable, it could be any of these formats. So it can tell you what exactly are the symbols, where is the code gonna be loaded, what are the permissions on all the different regions of memory, all really important things about your binary that are especially gonna be helpful when we get into exploitation. So the ELF file formats, First up, header, like most other things, uh, we have a program. So at high level, we separate up the program into a series of segments. So then we have our special ELF header, which has details as I'll show you in a second. Then we have a header table which says which of all these uh, sections, where they are in the binary, and what are the offsets, and any other important information. So the header has like a magic number, an addressing info, which says exactly how the addresses work, um, which will, oh no, sorry, that's 64 bit versus 32 bit. Uh, another one is the file type, which shows you uh, what specifically, what type you're using, the architecture type, what architecture you're using, and so on and so forth. Oh, other important things, entry point. So this is what address, when the program's loaded in memory, should we start executing from. So this is an incredibly important one. The program header position, where the program header table starts, the section header position, the size, the size of number, basically any information you need in order to parse the rest of this file format. Yes? I thought you said it was architecture dependent. It is. What's the architecture type? It tells you which architecture it is. So it's defined as whatever architecture type. So there's two different things in here. The, I believe the, Addressing info tells you if it's 32 or 64 size addresses, which you need to know to read the rest of the addresses. Uh, the file, the file type tells you, I believe, which one of the four types it is, and then the architecture type tells you which architecture it is. If it's Spark or x86 or whatever. Um, but that's just convention defined in the ELF header standard, right? So it would be some number would map to one of those. Cool. So then each section defines what the type of that section is and the permissions on this section. So this is, we gotta think about this is part of the binary file, right? This is some section of the binary file. And so, <coughs> There are bits that tell you, is this data or is this code, right? What is this, this section? If some sections actually have no part in the file, so let's say we want to pre-allocate a gig of memory in our program space, right? Because we know we're gonna use at least a gig of memory. We don't wanna actually have just a gig of zeros in our program and say, load this into a certain memory address, right? So we can actually say, hey, at this memory location in the program, allocate a gig of memory, but that doesn't actually exist in the file. We have symbol tables for static linking and dynamic linking. We have string tables, which shows us the strings. Uh, relocation tables, which helps when we're moving the file around. And so these are the important bits of permissions on memory. So, yes, that's right. So allocate, if we're gonna actually allocate what this section is in memory, write if we can write to this memory location. Why might we want to have sections of memory that we, the program cannot write to? To corrupt the data. As like a defensive programming measure? What do you use, do you ever use anything in your programming languages where you can't change a value? Yeah, constants. Either constants or a const structure, right? There's a lot of 
cases where you want maybe read-only memory, and this is a way to actually enforce that. So you gotta think what's gonna happen, right? You type in execute that program. You say like dot slash whatever, normal web server, right? What the operating system is gonna do is gonna look at this and put each segment where the program says, hey, this segment goes to this memory address, and it will put it there, and it will give it these permissions. So it'll give it right, executable, so there's an executable bit if the section can be executed. And a write execute, I think there's also a read, maybe there's not, maybe it's all readable. Uh, so that this way you can have different sections, like, uh, and have more fine-grained permissions rather than the entire memory can be read and written to by anyone, right? So this allows the program to have a little bit more control. So this is some of these typical sections when you look at these things. So the dot text segment uh, section is the program's code. So this is typically where your code goes. And it is allocatable, or alloc, which means that it came from the file, so the file got put there. And it's executable, which makes sense, right? We want to actually execute our code. If this executable bit was not set, we would get a segmentation fault whenever we try to execute our program. The dot data segment is for initialized data, so this is allocated from the code and it's writable. Dot RO data, what do you think the RO stands for? Read only. Read only. Yeah, so smart. <laughs> Read only data. <laughs> but still. So it comes from the program, but it doesn't have a writable flag set, so this is important. It means you cannot write to this memory. The operating system itself will stop you from writing to this memory. The .vss, so this is data that does not exist in the program itself. Or, sorry, this is data that does not exist in the file, but when the program is loaded, space is allocated for some segment here, for the VSS. Um, the init and the uh, finny, are pre and post code that's executed. So this does some setup and cleanup stuff, which we won't really go into here. So the PE file format is the exe file format on Windows. So this is the standard exe file format. The way, there's a lot of differences from um, the elf file format. So this, all programs there assume that they're going to be loaded into address zero. So address zero is going to be the first instruction that's always executed. Um, they, however, all programs are not loaded at memory address zero. They're moved around. And so the OS knows to fix this up. So the relocation will fix that up and will change all the addresses. So that's all we're going to say about that one. We don't do that too much. OK. Now we need to dig into assembly. So we need a primer on x86 instructions so that we can understand and look at actual binary code so that we can actually exploit binary code. So, the x86 family starts with the 8086, which was an old school CPU. It had 16-bit registers, and the idea was this became so popular that new CPUs, rather than defining a new instruction set architecture, said, well, we'll just use whatever the x that 8086 used. So what's the benefit there? Standardization. 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 Backwards compatible how? New systems use the old architecture. So what happens when you buy a new CPU? So I have an 8086, I buy a new CPU that's three times faster. You gotta rewrite all your software. You have to what? Not only do I have to rewrite all my software, that's the software I have, but what if it's not my software? What if somebody else gave me this binary, now I paid money for this system, and now I can't execute it on this new hardware, <coughs> right? So this means it needs to be recompiled by whoever created it, and then they have to give me a new binary specifically for this system. Uh, so this is part of, it's kind of like a historical weirdness, but it just, this became the de facto standard of CPUs. And so every single, so most CPUs support x86. Uh, uh, so eventually, so 16 bits is not a lot. What are the, what's the 
the main limitation of having the, the limits here? Memory size allocation? Yeah, one of the big ones, even though it's possible to do it, is memory size allocation. So it's difficult to address more than 2 to the 16 bytes, right? And to have that memory size. So eventually we have 32 bit registers. Um, and there's been a lot of actual extensions to x86, so there's all kinds of various speed improvements. They're actually, Intel's creating, and other companies are creating new instructions every year to do things faster. So they're doing crypto stuff natively in hardware, all kinds of cool stuff. Um, Hyper-threading, multi-core, 64-bit architecture. Anyways, this is, uh, yeah. Uh, it stood for the name of the processor. I know starting from the 8086, and then I don't know where that name came from. Obviously, the 8088 is too better. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think from there, it's probably marketing, although I think you have a Motorola chip, I want to say. Yeah. I think so. Um, so yeah, no, I don't know other than, I would say marketing, right? Like, what's the difference between a P3 or a P4? Right? Or like the, actually, they don't even have names. Sandy Lake versus the whatever newest Intel chip is, right? Similar things. Okay, so in x86, we want to address memory. Mainly, the way we're going to think about it is the flat memory model, which basically gives us 0 to 2 to the 32 minus 1 addresses that we can possibly address in, um, in our system. Uh, there is, so there is another way of segmented memory where you specify the segment first and then the offset within that segment and that is actually allows you to access more memory than 2 to the 32. So one of the, what's the core problem with a 32-bit system here? Yeah, so we can only access up to 4 gigs of memory, right? So how does your memory actually works. So let's take a step and think about, we have our program, right? We have our executable on disk. So it's just a file at this point. We call which system call to start executing that program? At this point, it's already been loaded. It's already a... Uh, Starting an executable file. It's done all the linking and everything. It's ready to go. Almost exec. No. <laughs> it's actually exec ve. So this is a system call. So what is this system call specifically? Generally, what's the system called? <laughs> yeah. It takes, uh, it takes you from user space to connect space. Yes, so it's a way for user space programs, right? Programs are not executing in the kernel. It's a way for a user space program to call some functionality of the kernel, right? So this is why I said you do uh, libc functions, which is just a library that you can use, and you can also <coughs> use uh, any kind of system calls. So the socket command is a system call. So the socket calls into the kernel to say, hey, I want to listen to a socket. Um, so that's all of what those libraries do, right? So the idea is you want some functionality of the operating system. So when we want to execute a new process, we actually call this exec ve, and we'll look at the parameters later, system call, which basically tells the operating system, here's the executable I want. You pass it a file, essentially the path to a file, and it, so what does it have to do? Load the program into memory. It has to load the program into memory. It has to look at the links, the link libraries and stuff, and convert those into It may have to do that. We can ignore that part for now. So it's going to read the ELF header file format. It's going to place each, copy each part from the file into the appropriate thing that the ELF header specifically says. So it's going to copy this thing to memory address this, this thing to memory address this, this thing to memory address this. 
But how do you do that? How does the, the operating system execute multiple programs at once? Ready? Yes. It does use a fork, but how does it actually, how come uh, your, all of your excellent uh, backdoor servers didn't crash my, my, my grading system? Even though you did, technically, but. <laughs> the timeshares. Timeshares, so they're not executing all at the same time, but what else? Context switch is how you switch between. But why do you need a context switch? So one part is installable. <laughs> How come I don't have to worry about you guys if you wrote a program that scanned all of its memory, are you going to find the other programs that are running on my system? Why not? What was that? Each is given like a virtual copy of memory. Yes. This is a key point about operating systems, right? One of the key abstractions they provide is every process that's executing thinks it has free reign over all the memory, right? So it can access everything from zero to however much. So this is a long way to get back to this four gigabyte limitation means that one program alone can't use more than four gigabytes of memory. But you could have, you could, I guess theoretically, they did have a, like a shim for a while where you could have a 32 bit system have more than four gigs of memory the operating system would be able to handle it, and then each program itself, or each process technically, would have up to four gigs of memory that it could use. But it couldn't use more than that. Yes? Uh, what if I have two programs, and they're taking the application of four GB memory, a program uh, working on this four, four GB memory if I have more than one processor? How does that virtualization work? So you're saying you have two, you have two processes? Yeah. They each, so the, it comes to the virtual memory management. So you should look up uh, virtual memory management of the operating system. So the idea is you physically have some memory, right? But there's a level of indirection between your, when your program says, hey, give me address zero, you don't actually get physical address zero. There's a level of indirection where the operating system has set up hardware that says, hey, actually for this process, Address zero is at address twenty. The table. Yes. So yeah. if, if my understanding of virtualization is correct, it's not the actual mapping of physical address. It's somehow related. So uh, what what I'm trying to say is, uh, even though your virtualization would be somewhere physical, it it doesn't store like it has to store some information if I have to access it. Maybe the oh two programs talking to each other. So you can, if you want two, pro, two different processes, right, to be able to talk to each other, you can use, uh, I believe it's mmap to, oh, maybe it's, you can map memory across both processes. So you have a shared memory region where you write from one process and you can read from the other process. So you have to set that up programmatically when the program first runs. And that's one way that you can get communication in between two processes. Program. Uh, what was that? You can, also use you can also use sockets on the files. You can just use files. You know, there's plenty of ways to talk to each other. You got to lock that memory every time. Yes, it's tricky. Any kind of distributed programming systems, right, are always tricky. Cool. Okay. Four gigs. Okay. Multiplying them, doing whatever we want to do to these registers 
is incredibly fast, A, and B is the only way we can actually perform any computations. So all computations must really happen on the registers. Um, on x86, there's four general purpose registers, A, B, C, and D. Super easy. The way these look, though, the EAX, EBX, ECX, and EDX. So we'll look at exactly what the difference is here, but for now the E stands for extended, and the A stands for the A, and the X, to be honest, I can't, maybe it was an extension to the original ones, I don't know what the X stands for. So four registers, EAX, EBX, ECX, EDX. Convention, and I don't really believe, but um, I'm going to these for now. So the idea is when you refer to, when you're writing assembly code and you refer to EAX, so for instance, if you're writing move EAX into EBX, when you write EAX, you are referring to the entire 32 bits that are inside the EAX register. So remember, we're talking about a 32-bit architecture. So this means the memory is, there are two to 32 memory addresses and the registers are 32 bits as well. If you only want to refer to the lower half, so how many byte bits is that? 16. It's the AX. So this is the difference. So this is why it can be confusing when you're reading code when it says, oh, copy EBX into EAX and then copy AX into ECX, right? Even though it's different work, I mean, different, looks like different registers, it's actually the same register. So you have to keep this mapping in your head. Also, you can even split that EAX register and access the upper part, so the upper eight bits, so the upper byte is the AH register. What does the H stand for there? Better, I don't I, yeah, so the, the high of the A register. And AL accesses the lower eight bits, so the, the lower eight bits of those registers. And you can do this for every single one of these four registers. So you can see, you'll, you'll, you will often see variations of these when looking at binary code. So there's other registers, the ESI register. Um, ESI and EDI are used, also two other registers, so now I have six registers, just like the other ones, we can have SI, all the other types of operations. Um, and then there are different, special purpose registers that are also really important. So we have ESP, which is the stack pointer. So why is the stack important? What is the stack? What is the stack in the context that we mean here? Yes, so stack is incredibly important for calling functions, right? So we need some way in memory to alloc uh, essentially keep track of the call stack of what functions we've called as the program executes and when functions return. So you can think of it as scratch memory. We're gonna get into it more. The really important thing is the top of the stack is the memory address that's in ESP. So there are some instructions that will, uh, you can actually, arbitrarily reference ESP. You can say move ESP into EAX. Uh, there are also another set of instructions that will implicitly modify ESP. So it's incredibly important to understand the semantics of those as well. EBP, which is the frame pointer, which we'll look at more in depth later. So the frame pointer points, so the stack pointer points to the current, uh, out the current location of the stack, of the topmost of the stack. And the frame pointer is a, is a pointer that remains constant throughout a function's execution that points and references local variables and parameters from the currently executing function. So we'll look at this more in depth in a bit. Uh, we have different segments. So this is how we access different segments. So we mentioned that there are ways to access different segments. Uh, the E flags register can, has a bunch of different flags that change depending on when the instructions execute. So this is where things like when test whether this uh, 
I think there's actually a zip construction and test whether this register is equal to like EAX equals EBX. And if it is, then it will set one of the bits in the E flags register. You almost never access this directly. Another key one, EIB. So the instruction pointer. This is the next line of code that will be executed. So when the program executes, right, it's going to start at whatever the entry point is. That's what the, the operating system is going to do, load everything in memory, set the EIP register. The very last thing it does is set the EIP register to be this, um, the, the entry point of the program, and then the processor will start executing from there. There is no program counter, so it's the same thing. Yeah, different. This is the other thing. Different architectures speak different languages, right? I think it's MIPS is the PC. Or is it ARM? I think ARM has a program, like a program counter register, so this has the EIP register. You also can't read or set this explicitly, so how do you change this value? Function calls, what else? Jumps. Conditional branches, all kinds of stuff. Right? All these things implicitly change this value. Uh, we'll get to that later. There's also a whole bunch of floating point operations. So when you're doing floating point operations, depending on how you're doing it, they may be offloaded to a different uh, floating point coprocessor for those things. Uh, anyways. The E flag bit, these are all the bits that can be set. I'm not going to go into them. Uh, data sizes, so review if you're not familiar with the different types of data sizes. A word is 8 bits, or sorry, I was looking at the exact right one. Okay. A byte is 8 bits, 2 bytes. 2 bytes is a word, 2 words is a double word, 2 double words is a quad word, and so on and so forth. I'm really to be honest, I usually think in terms of bytes. I don't usually think in terms of the words. Um, but you do have to be careful about when you're moving things and keep that there. OK. This is another incredibly important concept. So what is endianness? Yeah. It's really how you specify like um, something in memory. It's either the high side starts left-hand side or the high side starts at the right-hand side? The high what side? The value of the number you're representing. Most, most significant. significant. Not most significant bit, the most significant byte. So this specifies the byte order. So Intel uses little endian ordering, which seems counterintuitive. So this means if you had the number, let's see, how was it? Yeah. So if you have in memory, so at memory address 00F67B40, if at that memory address you have 0, above that you have 1, above that you have 2, and above that you have 3, if you were to ask the processor, hey, print out whatever's the 4 bytes or the word, whatever, the in, I think it was in, the 32 bit number that is at this 00F67B40. The question is, which number does it output? Does it output 03020100 or does it output 00010203? So in little Indian, it will output this way, right? It'll output. The most significant bit is at 4.3. So it will, the number will output will be whatever the equivalent is of hex 03020100. But if you took those same sequence of bytes, right, the same sequence of bytes in memory on a big Indian system, and you tried to ask what number that was, it would say 00010203. So this is why you have to. You know in that C code you wrote for the server, you had to write that H, H T O L N function. That's host to long number, I think. 
or host, no, HTML. It's the host to network long. So that takes in the, that when you said port 80, you want to listen on port 80, let's say. So the host is little Indian format, but the network order is big Indian format. So it actually has to swap them before it goes out on the network which is super annoying and confusing that the networking format is different than most of the hosts. But as long as everybody knows and does those uh, functions correctly, then it's fine. So this is really, really important, and this can be incredibly frustrating when you're trying to overwrite buffers. We'll see where the next gets into it. But if it's been a while, refresh yourself on the Indianness so that you'll understand when you're trying to do an exploit and you think that it's supposed to be working, but actually it ends up crashing. This is like the first place I always look. <coughs> okay, the other thing is about signed integers, right? So if you put in negative one into the program, how's that going to be represented? All S, right? This is the other thing. We're only able to look at, essentially, really, you're only able to look at what bits are in the registers and what bits are in memory. The interpretation of what those bits means depends on you, right? It depends on, is this an unsigned number? Then it's a really large number. If it's a signed number, then it's a negative number. So this is another thing that's really important to keep in mind. Even things like you know characters, right? If it's all just bytes, they're all just ones and zeros, right? And especially when you're just looking at debugging the processor, I mean, not the processor itself, but when you're debugging at the binary level without any source code to go back to, you don't know, is this an int or an unsigned int? You have to kind of infer based on its meaning and usage. Uh, so yeah, negative one is all S, negative two, right? Uh, the other thing that's super handy, which I always have out when I'm doing any of this kind of stuff, is a good programming language calculator. Uh, I actually get by pretty well on the calculator app on Mac. There's a mode, you can switch it to programming mode, so you can get uh, 64, uh, not, not 64, you get hex input mode, and it also shows you when you're typing in the exact like bit string of whatever the your input is. Um, really handy, I use this a lot, that's surprising enough. So make sure you have a calculator. Okay. So what does x86 look like as a language? So it is your, your coding assembly language, right? So you are basically right above ones and zeros, although you're essentially almost at ones and zeros because all the assembler does at this point is translate what you wrote to the equivalent ones and zeros. And it's not very complicated. So it should be. Uh, so who has experience with the assembly language? Okay, good. It should be fairly aware. So your assembly language code has some directives, which we'll look at in a second. Um, so similarly to the sections in the LP header, you can have a dot data section, which defines essentially variables, which will get placed in certain memory locations. Uh, instructions. To make it super confusing, there's you think like for something as important as assembly, and for something as important as x86, and for something as low level, there wouldn't be so many choices. Like how many ways are there to call a function in C? In C. One. And how many different syntax are there to call a function? How many different syntax is there to do anything to add a number? One. There's one way to do it. Right? But in x86, unfortunately, there are two different syntax, and it is completely opposite the order of operations. So in AT&T syntax, which is what we're going to be using throughout, which I will be using on my slides. You will have your basically your operator, so add, move, subtract, whatever, jump. So that's always on the left. But then it will be source to destination. So if you have move EAX comma EDX, this is move the value of EAX into the EDX register. Uh, Intel syntax 
is completely the opposite. So this is move from EBX into EAX. So you have two of the exact same instructions that are written completely backwards from each other. Um, there's also more differences. Uh, but I suggest you pick one, and every if you're ever using any tool that touches assembly, there's a way to change it from one to the other. Right? It's a trivial mapping, but you just need to know that in the settings um, when you set that up. So also, um, so here's my big tip on how I always figure it out, is I look for instructions that have a constant value. Because the, can the constant ever be the destination? No, and then that tells me for the whole rest of the file. Right? So I'll see if we're moving, if we're moving a constant zero into EAX, well I know I'm in at and syntax because it can't possibly be the other way around. If I'm moving EAX into zero, then I know I'm in Intel syntax because it can't possibly be doing that. <coughs> okay, so we can define constants. We can start constants with zero X. We can define uh, different labels and different types of data. We can define bytes, words, double words, quad words. Uh, for instance, we can define a my variable that is a double word, 32 bits, and so it, this would be two 32-bit values in the section of your assembly code. We can, you know, we can define all kinds of things, strings. So it depends. The and often these type of things are dependent on your assembler that you're using. So whether you're using like the GCC assembler, or using NASM, or whatever you're using, the syntax may vary slightly, yeah. Uh, so when you say constants, don't you sometimes just specify the address location, like move AB or move 10 to 7000? Ah, so yeah, so what this, um, uh, essentially this is a, li a little extra nice layer that the assembler is giving us. So now we can say like move bar into EAX and when it assembles it, it will put bar in a specific memory location and when we look at what assembly code it generated, it will say if bar is at 7000, it will say uh, dereference 7000 and take whatever's there and move it into EAX. So it gets rid of all that for us. So that, but this is some niceties for us when we're programming in uh, assembly. And then we need to address memory, right? So we don't need to just move things from registers to registers. We need to be able to say, access the thing that's at this memory location and copy it into a certain register. So all of these have, and surprisingly, again, for such a you know, simple, low-level language, it's actually quite complicated how to do these memory accesses. Uh, so we have the width, so what's the size of the memory that we're trying to, to access? What's the base, so what's the starting address? Uh, which index in there are we getting? And scale and displacement. So we have the starting address, the offset from that base address, the scale is the constant multiplier from the index. Um, width, yeah. width tells us are we are we doing bytes? So are we doing uh, bytes, shorts, words, longs, or quads? And that'll be in the instruction itself on the left. Let me build an example. The formula is essentially like this: the start of the base, go index times the scale plus some constant displacement. So think about, I always think of this like arrays, right? We have an array of characters, and we're going to index it. Well, that means the base is going to be the address of our array. The zeroth element will be index zero times the scale, which is one, right? Which would be one byte. And then if index is one, it will access the next one. And if we're talking about integers, those will be 32 bits, so the scale will be larger there. Let's an example. The way it's written is like this. So displacement on the left, base index scale, and if index and scale are, are uh, if the index is zero, it won't be there, and if scale is clear, it will also not be there. So many times you'll see it kind of like this. So what is this doing? So first, what's the L on the move? Along. So we're moving 
32 bits. Right? So long as two words, a word is two bytes. We're going 32 bits. So that so the the move here, right? This if this was a B, it would mean we're copying one byte. If it's an S, it means we're copying um, also a byte. I don't know the difference between the byte and the word. Uh, if it's a W, we're moving a word. If it's an L, we're moving along. If it's a Q, we're moving a quad. So this means start at EAX, right? EAX is what? What is inside EAX? The address of whatever we're trying to dereference or we're trying to access the memory of, right? So it'll be some memory address, and this is important, right? You think of it like a pointer. This is another thing that's important, right? It's a pointer. Inside the EAX right now is just an address. And this operation is essentially dereferencing that pointer, following that pointer. But it's not just following it directly, it's following it and it's getting that address plus ECX times 4. So if ECX is 0, it will get whatever's at EAX. Uh, minus pointing X. And we'll copy that into EDX. Wait, is that right? Source, destination? No, destination, source. Yeah, so copy that into EDX. What's that? Plus <coughs> what? You said copy that. What's that? This. <laughs> into here. So. More simple ones. So what's this going to do? The log int at address EDD minus eight uh, bits, I guess, and then we move that to the EAX. Yes. So take EDP, take EDP minus eight, whatever's located there at that memory address, take it and move it into EAX. So we're essentially, think of here, we're addressing fixed offsets of the base pointer of EDP. So EDP, as we'll see, gets set up when, the, when, a, uh, when a function starts executing. And so we will go down eight bytes, access whatever integer is there, copy that into EAX. If it's zero, well, eight is the same as mole. Yeah. So yeah, if there's zero x, it'll be x. If it's not, it'll be decimal. Talk about I think so. Yeah. So like in this case, this is um, 32. Or yeah, right. Okay. Uh, so this is 32. So it's so minus 32. This one is just minus eight. So this is where the one we're doing is move source into destination. So this is move from EDP minus eight, whatever's at that memory location, copy that into EAX. Okay. Did I answer your question? I think both are addressing Both are what? Addresses, specifications. Into EAX or into the address which is added. Address address, which is contained. Ah. This is move it into the registered EAX. So let's. Um, let's draw a picture. Actually, it's always handy. All right. So now this instruction on that. in EAX, so we just put hex 20 in there. Move whatever's inside EAX to wherever EDX points to plus the address that EAX points to plus ECX times 2. Is, is that the value that's in ECX? So the value inside ECX, yes. 
We only dereference when we see the parentheses, so this is the important part. Now, so in our specific syntax, dollar sign before a number means a constant. So this is move the constant string, uh, sorry, move the constant value 804A0E4 into EDX. So this is all this is doing. It's no memory manipulation, no nothing. Just straight copy that value into the EDX register. Yes? Uh, are these uh, registers some special kind of memory or they are just locations on RAM? Uh, these, the registers are on the chip itself. So these are, you're really stressing my rubber knowledge. Flip-flops on the chip itself as part of the architecture. Um, so they actually do not exist in RAM at all. So whenever you want, this is why when you get in the habit of looking at your code, what will happen is you'll copy a value from a local variable into a register, then another value from a local variable into a register, add the two, and then copy it back into a third variable in memory. Because unless it gets back to memory, it might as well have not happen. Right, because it's still in the register of the processor. Yes? Uh, what if the register doesn't contain uh, any memory address? Uh, so will it like subtract the decimal value and with it and copy it to the... So what does it, what does it mean to not have a memory address? Uh, All right. Ah, okay, so important difference. So the difference between this move and this move is what? Yes, dereference. The important one is the dereference. Dereference, access what, whatever is at memory address 804A0E4, copy whatever's there, the four bytes because it's an L, copy that into EAX. What does the percent sign mean in the last one versus the last one? Or the, the second to last one versus the last one? The, the percent sign means the register. So this is uh, this specific syntax of registers. But the last one is like that, and but does, does that have to do with the referencing too? The percent? The percent? There's a the percent. You're talking about the dollar sign? The dollar sign means a constant value. Uh, yeah, for whatever reason, you don't need a dollar sign when you're doing this move L uh, on the next one. I think it's a syntax thing. I don't know exactly why. So when you use parentheses, you don't need the dollar sign? Correct. I think it'll it would throw an error if you tried that. I didn't know what register to get it from. Who do you want to register? On that last one, the zero x eight zero four. Well, it's not a register. It's a constant value. So it says copy the content of memory at address eight zero four a zero e four into eax. So the difference between the two is, in this one, we are copying the constant value 804A0E4 into EVX. So if after this instruction is executed, EVX better have this exact value. Right? Whereas in the second one, it says, access the memory. Look up memory. Look up whatever that 804A0E4, whatever's in there, copy it into EAX. Yes. So um, when you say move L, well, what if I said move B? Move B, and then so would, would it only look at like eight of the, the first eight of, or? It would only look at that byte, like whatever is at that byte location in memory. Yeah, and then it, it wouldn't like so it's just like when you say move L, it's just a send thing in the side that you're looking at. Yes. So then you're interpreting. So move B is this is the address. Copy that byte into EAX. If it's move L, it's saying copy that in the next four, the next four bytes and interpret that as a little Indian number. Well, well interpretation doesn't matter if you're just copying. But take those four bytes, copy them into EAS. Yes. And this memory address is always referencing the RAM when it's not like restoring cache memory on the Correct. processor. Correct. Only RAM. Yes. There may be caches in the way, but that's more advanced. Value after the dollar signs. Let's get a couple more questions then. Yeah. Value is Yes, that is a constant value. So 
So whenever you change that, that will be the value of EAX after this is executed. Cool. All right. So when we get back, we'll learn about more types of instructions.